Hello, everyone. I think you see a few people are still logging on, but um, we're going to kind of start soft start here and get started. Um, as people join, uh, please, please feel free to jump in. We'll do a little bit of get to know each other in a little bit. Um, so I'm, you know me, I'm Lexi. Uh, most of you know me. I'm the director of MGLEX. Um, today we have one of our summer interns with us, Michaela, and lots of other people who you'll meet later. So uh, let's see. Um, I'm going to pull up our presentation, and hopefully most of our summer interns have logged in. We're going to call on you to introduce yourself, so when it's your turn, just unmute yourself, say hi, and you can tell us a little bit about yourselves. Um, so welcome to the inaugural session of uh, the MGLEX uh, virtual conference series. This is um, an interactive um, emergency medicine specifically focused um, online series that we'll be doing every month. Um, it should be most of the months will be the first Thursday of the month. There will be a couple of exceptions, October being one of them because there's a number of conferences the first week of October, mainly the American College of Emergency Physicians, so we're all going to be there. So October will be the second Thursday of the month, but every other month will be this exact time and place, and um, we will have a link updated on the website. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and start the first presentation. Today is going to be a little bit unique just because it is our first um, conference. So we're going to mostly talk about the nonprofit and the program today to familiarize whoever is not, uh, doesn't know about it already. And um, we'll have a chance to ask questions specifically about what we're doing, our exchange program, and a number of other topics. Um, the topic of the month this month is not just the um, program and the nonprofit, but also simulation. So a big portion of our exchange program as well as our simulation, I'm sorry, our virtual conference series is simulation, which we will be doing today. Uh, we're going to have the University of Chicago residency has kindly um, volunteered to help us out. So they are actually having their conference right now that they have every week. Um, they do a monthly uh, simulation lab conference as well. And so that some of the residents are going to stay behind after their conference and help us with our simulation. So we're going to have that as our second hour. Um, so the, the general um, conference setup is going to be the first hour, other than this month, which will be a little bit different, will be three short lectures the first hour, 15 to 20 minutes. The third of those will be each month we'll have a country of the month. We're going to feature one of the countries participating in our exchange program. So this month will be Italy, since that is the country where this whole program started. Um, so we're going to have uh, residents from Italy representing um, their own country to tell us about the status of emergency medicine there. And um, then we'll go into our second hour, which is our sim hour. So we're going to have two cases. Um, the first case will be a demonstration, like I mentioned, from the University of Chicago residents that are going to show you how they do a sim case. And then we'll have a chance to do a debrief and talk about the case. The second case will be interactive for our country of the month in the hot seat. They are going to be running the case and we'll do it like a tele telemedicine type of, um, of experience, and we will be your eyes and ears and hands. Um, and so they will be running the second case for us in our sim lab, which we'll talk about later, and we'll have a, a chance to debrief. The third hour will be one longer lecture, um, the keynote lecture of the month. This month, as I mentioned, is our simulation month. So we're going to have our simulation fellow um, and then our simulation lab staff. So we actually have full-time people who their job is to be sim techs that work here all the time. So they're going to talk to you about our simulation lab, what they do, and um, some of the interesting things that um, are involved with simulation in the United States. And then we'll have a chance at the end for a question and answer, just open-ended about anything you want. All right. So let's get started. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Second. Just have to get my. Is that working? This is yours. Sorry, technical difficulties. One second. Okay, here we go. Later. Uh oh. Um. Give me one second. I have to log out and log log right back in. So give me one minute. Is it gonna log everybody out? 
Let me see. Hold on. Let me let me join this from another computer because we're having technical difficulties. I'm going to hand it over to Michaela for one minute. Hi. All right. So now I have to log in. If anyone can't see me, please mention it in the chat right now. Um, otherwise, I'm going to get started. Okay. Chat. Yes, we see you. Awesome. Thank you. How do I? One second. We're working out some technical difficulties since it's our first time. Just be patient. I'm an old lady. I don't know how to use technology. All right. You got me on there? Awesome. OK. Perfect. Now I need to share my screen. Share. Here we go. Are you All right, so I'm going to be here, and our you should be able to see our presentation. Yeah, I'll talk over here. I will talk over here. Okay, this should work okay. So welcome, as I said, to our inaugural um, virtual conference series. Uh, you all know me. I'm Lexi once again, if you just joined. Um, I'm the director of MBLEX, and I'm going to start talking about what MBLEX is and what we do. Okay. So this is our first uh, virtual conference. As I mentioned, we're going to do this every month. Um, I think it's going to be an, a great opportunity both to learn about emergency medicine and to interact with your peers from other countries. Um, there's going to be time at the end, as I mentioned, to ask questions, and I encourage you to interact with each other. Um, and talk to each other and find common ground and potential ways you guys can collaborate with each other. Um, that's my goal here is to have our own little kind of social network that we can talk once a month and um, think of ways we can help each other. The audio is lower. How's that? Better? I'm going I'm to talk on the other computer. How's that? 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 How's Apologies. Moving on. Okay. Um, so this is me. This is basically my bio from the website. I do actually kind of look like that uh, occasionally. Um, you can read more about me if you're interested. Um, um, but basically, this whole um, this whole project came from um, an idea that I had after my own experiences doing um, an exchange programs. Actually, um, I had done a number of exchange programs both as a college student. I did an Erasmus program in Italy, and then I went back to Italy again to do my Fulbright scholarship, and I went back to Italy again <laughs> later on to do my elective in my residency program, which is when I sort of discovered um, that emergency medicine is not the same all over the world, and um, kept you know, wishing I had a way to help make things better, improve the specialty, develop the specialty in other places, starting in Italy, 
where it was a new specialty and um, not well developed, especially within training programs with lots of variations in residency programs and um, different different outcomes for people. So I had the idea. I kept thinking to myself while I was there, I wish I could bring people home with me and show them how we do it in the United States. So I said, okay, why not? And this, this crazy idea has turned into what we are seeing today, um, which we'll go through how this all happened, but that's kind of where this came from. So we're gonna start by introducing our team. Um, most of the interns are here, a few people are not. Um, so first, we'll talk about our board of directors. So this is Will. Um, Will was um, a resident at University of Chicago that helped me with the first iteration of the exchange program while he was a resident. Um, he has then gone on to graduate and he has done an international emergency medicine fellowship at University of Chicago, which he has also finished and is now at Harvard being a big shot doctor, but he is also on our advisory board and helps us out um, quite a bit. He's awesome. So you guys will all meet Bill. Then there's Stefano. Stefano was actually one of our participants in our exchange program the first time around, um, and he has gone on to finish residency in Italy and apply for residency in the United States. So he is actually a resident now in Rhode Island um, doing his second residency in the States. Um, and so he's got awesome perspective, both as a participant of the exchange program and now as an American resident and as a member of our board. So he's a great resource for those of you thinking about the exchange program. Um, so you can reach him through the website as well um, and ask him any questions you like. All right, let's move on to our summer intern. So we've been very lucky this summer to have lots of extra hands um, getting us actual progress. And so I'm gonna let everyone introduce themselves um, and tell you, tell you a little bit about themselves. Um, so if you want to, um, you can just unmute yourself and turn on your camera. And um, let's start with Hazem. Uh, hi, um, my name is Hazem Abdel Nagid. Uh, do you guys hear me by the way? I'm actually dying, dialing in. So. All right, cool. So yeah, my name is Hazem Abdel Nagid. Uh, I'm a rising sophomore studying neuroscience at Brown and I'm interested in pursuing a career in medicine. Um, I'm originally from Egypt, and in my free time, I kind of like to immerse myself in Islamic studies. And the medicine and the Islamic studies as they kind of combined pretty neatly in something they're calling Islamic bioethics, which is pretty cool. All right, thank you, Hassan. He's been a, a great member of our team and is helping us with a number of projects um, and helping with some biostatistics for a publication we're working on. Um, next will be Alicia. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Alicia. Um, I'm going to be a rising senior at Brown and I study immunobiology and public health. Um, I am definitely excited to be part of this project. I love, um, you know, just traveling and international exchange, so I'm really grateful um, to have met Lexi and all the other interns. But yeah, I also am planning on pursuing medicine and outside of that I love nature outside, like hiking and all of that. Thank you very much, and I'm sorry I never say your name properly, but I will learn. Um, all right, Emily. Hi, I'm Emily. I'm a rising junior concentrating in public health, and I'm interested in pursuing a career in healthcare policy and hopefully getting my master's in public health after college as well. And I've really enjoyed working on this project and learning more about healthcare in this aspect. All right, thank you. Well, Alicia and Emily are both on our uh, publication team amongst many other projects that they have been working all summer on. All right, next is Michaela, and I'll just turn my computer for her. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Michaela. I'm going into my final year at Loyola, um, Chicago, um, and I'm studying um, public health and biostatistics. Um, and I also have a minor in Spanish, so it's been really fun to see how all of those come together on this project, and I think to one day um, find some type of community working in global health and community health. All right. Thank you. Michaela was uh, our, actually our spring of 22 intern from Loyola and decided to help us stay on and help us out, and we are very appreciative for that. All right. Hi, uh, my name is Kate or Catherine, which I really prefer. Um, I'm a sport brown, and I'm planning on concentrating in neuroscience. And I'm also involved in just a lot of like neuroscience-based clubs at Brown. And you know, in those classes, you don't really get to experience so much the you know, like more public health 
bit of healthcare. And so through MGLEX, I've really just enjoyed being able to explore that side more so and feel more in action and trying to better the healthcare system in whatever way we can. All right. Thank you very much. And she's also been on a number of our um, project groups uh, helping us out this summer. All right. Um, Stephanie is, I believe, in a plane somewhere uh, over the ocean. I don't think she's here. I'm, I'm here. Oh, you are here. I'm you here. I'm okay. here. This is the beginning. Still um, here. <laughs> Hi, I'm Stephanie. I'm a rising junior at Brown University. Um, I'm majoring in bio and hopefully going to apply to either, or we're still, I'm still deciding, but maybe med school now working with Unlock has kind of opened my eyes to the issues um, with, you know, uh, emergency medicine, how it, there needs to be more training, and honestly, um, it's, yeah, it's been pretty great. I've a lot. All right. And Stephanie actually is local here in the Chicago area, and so she's been able to come and see the Sim Lab also and do the shift here as well as Michaela. So um, they got to do a little a taste of what the exchange experience um, will be like for you guys. All right. Will, you're up. Hi. Um, my name is Will. I am going to be a junior this year at Brown studying bio and international affairs. Um, also at school, I'm a writer for Brown Political Review and involved in Carefree Clinic in Providence. Um, I've just had such a wonderful time this summer. Dr. Azro has, you know, is someone who's so passionate about um, making healthcare more accessible for people and improving the system. So it's just been like a really inspiring experience getting to be involved with these projects. So yeah, thank you. Thank you, Will. Um, Will has been helping with a number of programs like everybody else, so I'll just say that for everybody because uh, everyone has done a lot of things. All right, next we have Dylan. Are you here? I can't see everybody. Let's see. Not sure if she is here. Okay. Um, well, she is a rising junior at Brown. I'll present her for her. She's studying biochemistry and molecular biology, and um, she's got a lot of sort of moving around experience, and she, she was interested in learning a little bit more about international emergency medicine. And, um, she's been helping with a number of our projects, and she's been kind of our social media person. So you can thank her for the awesome posts that we've had lately on our social media, which is um, we have Facebook, we have Twitter, we have um, uh, Instagram, we have LinkedIn, we have all the things. So she's helping us keep you guys up to date. And then Valentina, um, I think she's here also. She, um, she is also a rising junior and studying biomedical engineering. Um, she's actually from Argentina, so again, a little bit of international um, experience in the past. And um, she's interested in the intersection of medicine and technology and data science. So she's also been helping um, quite a bit with um, things for our publication and some of our other projects. So let's get started with the rest of our talk. Sorry, the slide didn't change. There it is. Okay. So, um, yeah. All right. So let's get started. We're going to talk for the next few minutes about um, the background of why we're doing what we're doing. We'll talk about the nonprofit um, MGLEX, and then we'll talk about the exchange program, which is our big main focus. Um, so, as most of you know, if you're here, um, there are many countries that, um, you know, so let me take a step back. So, much of international and global emergency medicine often focuses on um, underserved countries, low income countries, vaster areas, um, things like that, and that's really important. But there's a part of global emergency medicine that's have less of a focus, and that is kind of where we come in. So that is countries with actually well-developed healthcare systems, modern healthcare systems, high-income countries, but that don't have emergency medicine as a specialty the way we have in the United States and a few of the other countries of the world. Um, and so some places have recognized it recently as a specialty. Some haven't recognized it yet at all. The map you see here is actually from the American College of Emergency Physicians uh, International Section, which I'm a part of. I'm the ASAP ambassador to Italy, 
and every year we meet with ambassadors from different countries and talk about status of emergency medicine. So this map, uh, mostly looking at Western Europe, is a map of where it is a specialty, where it isn't, and where we just don't know. So as you can see, um, there are a number of large countries that don't have emergency medicine recognized as a specialty, which, you know, as an American doctor in 2022 is still kind of hard to believe. And most of my colleagues in the United States that find out about this are also kind of shocked when they find out about it. So um, it's, it's a very different type of work when you're working in a country that has a well-developed healthcare system and has some kind of thing in place for an emergency department, but that looks very different from a well-developed modern emergency department with specifically emergency medicine residency trained doctors. Very different thing. So that's what we're trying to help do. Um, it's a, again, there's unique challenges to this that are very different from what most, most of global emergency medicine is doing, but it's no less important. I mean, there are almost a billion people in Europe alone that don't have access or reliable access to a well-trained, emergency-specifically residency-trained physician, sometimes in most of their country. And, um, you know, no, not to say anything about the people that are working in emergency departments. They're wonderful. They're working very hard. But it's, it's a different thing. Like I mentioned, like if someone asked me to go be a cardiologist, well, I mean, I could probably muddle through, but I wouldn't know exactly what I was, you know, what I was supposed to know because I didn't have that training. And training is so important for patient outcomes. Uh, it's just the, the, one of the most important factors for morbidity and mortality is training for the emergency physician. So this is a problem we're hoping to help improve. Mm -hmm. So um, when the slide loads, <laughs> we're going to, okay, here we go. So as I mentioned, all of this work started out with Italy, which is where I had done my exchange program. Um, and so here's an example of, of some things that were from a few years ago before COVID, but um, some of the challenges that they had been facing. Um, it's a newly recognized specialty from 2009 in Italy, which they'll talk about in the leave that to them. Um, there's not enough training spots for the needs. There's a huge hole where they need thousands and thousands of doctors to fill in um, the staffing at emergency departments. There's not, there's not a standardized um, training program for residency, so each residency does things a bit differently. Um, there's not enough people that are well trained, like I said, specifically in emergency medicine um, to train students because it's a new specialty, so it's sort of this catch-22. Um, we have a very divided labor system in terms of who runs what in the emergency department. Whereas in America, I as an emergency physician see all patients. It's much more divided and there's different specialists involved in the emergency department which makes things more complicated. Because of this, there's a lot of resistance actually and this is one of the key differences in what we're focusing on versus much of what global emergency medicine focuses on in, in lower income countries or disaster medicine or things like that. No one's telling you they don't want you there. In this situation, in a country with a well-developed healthcare system, there's a lot of pushback from certain particular specialties that are, that are concerned about their livelihood or whatever else, that there's a lot of resistance. And then there's the usual problems, overcrowding, overworking, not enough staff, not enough money for the job that, that should be paid. And so it's a big challenge. Um, and so you can see what a huge lack of spots um, there are, over 4,000 spots, and that was from 2018, that we just don't have people for. So how do we start to fix this problem? Um, and so as I mentioned, I had been, this is a picture from 2014, um, when I did my elective rotation in Rome at Umberto Primo with the awesome staff there. Um, and they're great, and they're worked so hard, but it's very hard to be effective when you have all of these hurdles in front of you. So how do we fix this problem? So our first goal before MGLEX existed, when this was just with um, Italy, was to develop and improve the clinical and educational practices of emergency medicine in Italy. Um, so this is a timeline of how the initial program, which was called Chico's at the time, um, which was the Chicago Cosmeo, which is the Italian Emergency Medicine Residents Association, that was our partnership. So as I said, 2014, when I did my elective in Rome, this idea was sort of um, started in my head. So I spent the next few years just going to conferences and talking to people and making connections. And I cannot stress enough how crucial that's been in everything I've done. Just making 
connections with people, forming relationships, and maintaining them. And I, I really recommend to pay attention to that in your own careers because it will get you closer, really. So I did that. And um, I sat at a dinner at a conference next to the residency director of Naples, of one of the Naples, Italy residency programs. And right on the spot, he said, you know what? I'm going to send you some residents to do this program. It's a great idea. And I said, but I'm not ready. And he said, if you wait till you're ready, you'll never do it. And he was right. So we started uh, a test run in 2017. And those residents had a great time. And they connected me with Cosmeo. So the next uh, November, at another conference, I made a trip to meet with the directorship there. And they thought it was a great idea. And we formed a partnership. And uh, we announced the program in 2017. We had an amazing response. It was great. And in April, we started the program, April 2018. Um, so we went from nobody in 2014 to in uh, May of 2018, I was invited to be the keynote speaker at the Italian National Emergency Medicine Conference. So this was a big change. And so people started to hear about this. The program went on to be successful for a second year, which ended in March of 2020. And as you all know what happened in March of 2020, particularly in Italy, the program had to be put on hold. So um, we'll talk about what happened next, but I'm going to talk a little bit about what we did in the first place. So it's a multifocal type of training program. Um, there's clinical training. There's didactics. There's experiential learning. Um, and the idea is to be able to learn from our experience in the United States of over 50 years of emergency medicine in the context of international healthcare systems and having people running the program who are familiar with those systems and have been there and seen it in that context to learn what would be useful from us to take home. That's the whole idea. You're not going to take, you're not going to remember everything you learn, but you will see a few key points either in how we teach or something how we do in the department or some procedural skill that then my goal is to have people take home and share with their colleagues and start to transform the specialty from the inside out as an investment in the next generation of doctors, which is you guys, the residents and the young attendants. So um, how it works is the same like everything. It's based on you know common educational uh, premises, which is observe and learn. So you see one, you do one, and then when you go home, you teach one. We talk about it in SimLab. We discuss it at conference and really drive the points home that then you take with you when you go back. So 2020, we had to pause the program. Last year, when things started to improve with COVID, I thought, okay, I think we can maybe restart soon. Um, but I took the time to reorganize and do the thing I had always planned to do, which was do this better in a more organized way. And so that's where MGLEX came to. Um, so this is... We can, but it, it gave me an echo. Um, it didn't really work, but it's okay. Can you guys hear me okay? If not, let me know. Um, so then MBLEX was, the idea for this was, was founded, and I had always intended to expand this program to other countries that were in similar circumstances, and I saw this as the opportunity to do it. Um, when I wasn't spending all my time actually with the residents, um, I was able to uh, spend some time figuring out how to make this a better program. So I started this, this nonprofit organization in uh, July of 21. We literally just had our one-year anniversary last week. Um, so we're excited about that. And um, so the idea was to, to help support the exchange program and then have a platform to expand to other um, opportunities. And this is one of them. So you are seeing one of our first new programs, which is our virtual conference series, which we are very excited about. So um, this is just basically about us. Um, as I mentioned, we're a not-for-profit organization. We're trying to support educational-specific programming in emergency medicine, specifically. Um, again, we were started in Italy, but now we're expanding, as we have all these international cases today. Um, so we're trying to help support countries who are just beginning their journey towards building emergency medicine by using our extensive experience. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. You can learn from what we've done and the mistakes that we've made. Help make it easier next time. So, 
This is our mission, to help provide tools and enrich education for the future of emergency medicine. Um, this picture is uh, was a reunion of the past participants of the program um, one year in Italy a number of years ago. And these were, you can see everyone, is, it kind of forms a little community, a little family, and it's a really great thing to have. Um, our vision is basically uh, what we've talked about, to help countries with well-developed healthcare systems, but have new or no emergency medicine and are in early stages of health. Our goal is to create a world where regardless of location, demographic, or ability to pay, all patients who present to any emergency department can be treated by a well-trained, compassionate, and competent emergency physician who walk out of the hospital to tell the tale. That's our goal. Okay? So what is our value? So our, as I mentioned, our exchange program is a, is a big part of what we do. Um, I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. We are restarting the program, as most of you know, in January. Um, and so this is, again, a multifaceted rotation to see different types of hospitals, environments, and spaces um, within the context of the United States healthcare system. I think someone's uh, audio is on, if you wouldn't mind. So we are restarting in January. Um, we are going to continue having our Chicago program, and we are very excited that I, we're going to have a second city as an option in the United States, and that's going to be Gainesville, Florida, so the warm weather component of the program. Um, and so the shifts in the uh, exchange program are observation, but as most of you know, when you're in an emergency department, you're on a small team, either with just an attending or an attending and a resident. You can still be very involved in talking about the patient listening to how the residents interact, doing a differential diagnosis, making a plan for patients. So you're still part of the team. You can't, you know, personally be in charge of the patients or procedures or things like that. But you're there, front row, to see what's going on and be a part of the discussion. I think it's a really um, useful type of experience. So Chicago um, is where the program started. Um, so there are multiple hospitals, residency programs, and universities that are affiliated with us. So here's a list of where shifts are distributed in Chicago um, through all four North Shore um, University Healthcare System hospitals. So Evanston, which is where we are right now, Skokie, Glenbrook, and Highland Park, which is the Highland Park that, if you've heard of in the news, that was we had a unfortunately a mass shooting event on the fourth of July, and um, Highland Park Hospital was where most of the victims were taken. So. Um, that is something we have also experienced and are working on our own um, to sort of figure out um, plans for the future. Hopefully there's something that happens again, but um, it is an opportunity to hear about that if you're interested in that type of disaster as well. Um, in addition to the hospitals at North Shore, we um, go to UIC, we go to Cook County, we go to Cook County of ER fame, um, and some other places that we can learn about more. On the website, you also participate in weekly conference with our own residents from multiple different residency programs in the city and a lot of sim lab stuff, both with the residents and just with me, one on one. And so I think this is a really um, interesting type of multi multifactorial experience. You also, depending on when you are here, get to go to our conferences. You go to the Illinois conference, the national ASAP conference, the citywide conference. There's some other special stuff. So different stuff during different times of the year. Um, and so, obviously, um, there's Florida, which is new. I will be going there next week to talk about them as well. But Florida um, is University of Florida. This is a little bit of a different experience. They have one really big hospital with lots of specialties and fellowship programs, and they will be able to tell you more about that um, if that's something you're interested in. And so this is a, a listing of the types of shifts you will be doing. Um, so both the both emergency department, ICU, and um, pre-hospital physician response vehicle. Also different types of emergency departments as well. Um, they also will have um, interesting opportunities. As I said, they have many, many fellowships and um, lectures. You'll be included in everything there. And if you're there in the right season, you might be able to go work at a football game, which is fun. This is a picture of their stadium. And it's actually a huge football school, so this is a cool opportunity for like a um, large group medicine. And then the fun part. So um, both rotations allow you lots of free time um, for 
pursuing local stuff, Chicago, Florida, you can travel around Florida, Orlando, Miami. Um, and in Chicago, there's lots of stuff to do all the time. So you'll have plenty of opportunities, and we run lots of social events, dinners, and things, and the past participants can tell you all about that. So you can learn more about this on our website, which is mglex.org or .com, table four. Um, and there's lots more information there. As I said, applications are open. We've already had a lot of applications um, come through from lots of different countries, so it's going to be a really great uh, first part of our second uh, version of our exchange program. Um, I have this slide, which is not loading, but on the website you can find, there it is, apply here in lots of different places. So if you're interested, please apply. Um, okay, so we'll have a few minutes for questions. I want to leave enough time for our Italian friends to do their presentations, but let's just take a couple minutes now. If you have any specific questions, um, please just speak up or put them in the chat. And if not, we'll keep going. I should add that um, the program is open to residents in emergency medicine, and if your country doesn't have emergency medicine, just people interested in emergency medicine. Um, and also, since we've been on pause for a few years, I am opening the program to young attending physicians who have recently graduated um, since they, had, they wouldn't have had the opportunity. For them. All, of those are, um, all of those are people who would have If there are no questions, we will move on um, to our Italian presentation of our country. All right. Let's see. Continue to touch. How is the application process done? Okay. So when you go through the link on the website, um, there's a form to fill out. Um, that's the start. And then I will go through all of those and interview each applicant personally. And then we will make our final list of participants. The criteria are that you are, like I said, either a resident in emergency medicine or interested in emergency medicine, if that's not an option for you, or a young attending um, that is interested in developing your skills. Um, the only things that you need other than that is the right attitude and the right reasons for coming. Um, there's some basic paperwork you have to fill out, some you know, patient privacy forms, you'll need vaccination records. Um, things like that, and then a letter of good standing from your institution that they're okay with it, and um, that's really about it. It's very straightforward. There's lots of paperwork, but it's not hard. It's just a lot of forms to fill out. And so as long as you are coming for the right reasons, you have a good proficiency in English, um, that's obviously important, and um, have eligibility from your home institution, that's really all you need. All right. We are going to on to Italy, and you can make you know a presenter. One second. Okay. So you can bring up your slides, and we will... Okay, we should be making co host so you should get a button up soon to share your screen. And you can go ahead and share your slides. Okay, both Michaela and uh, Bruno should be presenters now. So you can go ahead whenever you are ready. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hi. All right. Okay. Yeah, Bruno. Bruno is going to present this yeah. slide. Yeah, I'm trying. Good morning, everybody. Uh. Okay, I uh, I am Michela from Italy, and um, I am attending my third year of emergency medicine residency. And uh, I'm here with Bruno and Letizia. Uh, they both are um, residents in Italy. Bruno is from the north of Italy. Instead, Letizia, uh, she is from the very south of Italy, from the beautiful Sicily um, island. 
and uh, the three of us are uh, we are part of um, COSMEL, which is our national um, uh, emergency medicine residence association. And now we we are going to talk. Um, I think uh, I'm. We we both are will be very uh, rapid because uh, Lexi already talked uh, told about um, emergency medicine in Italy, but uh, we are going to talk from our perspective. Okay, here we are. Okay, so. Uh, Um, I can't hear you. I think the problem is um, that not going on presentation mode. Maybe do no. He's starting again, okay. <laughs> if anyone has any questions while we're waiting for technical difficulties, you can do that too. Or, I have an idea. Let's do this. Um, I see you I have a question. Are you back? Oh, go ahead. Well, yeah. Question. question. Yeah, hi, Christian is my name. I'm actually from Sweden, uh, but actually coming from Argentina. Hi. Uh, actually, you were talking about Italy and all the, well, all the the fighting that you were having there when you moved there to start the emergency medicine training. Uh, you were actually describing Sweden today. It's like uh, we have an emergency medicine training, but we have a lot, a lot of challenge. For example, other specialities taking a lot of parts in the emergency in the emergency room, for example. How did you manage that? How did you manage the, the challenge? And how did you? I mean, we have, for example, the anesthesiologist team coming down and taking care of the airway just because we are not we are not well trained in the airway. Even if I was working as an anesthesiologist for many years before I started my training as an emergency doctor. Do you understand my question? Yes. And I'm glad you asked that question because that's a very good question. And that is actually a big part of why I wanted to bring everyone together in this virtual conference to see that you are not alone and many other places have gone through the exact same thing. Um, I will let the Italians answer that, but based on my experience, they're still going through the same thing. Um, it's the same with anesthesia. Um, there's a lot of pushback. They want to run all the critical care. They want to do the procedures. And it's a tough thing to convince them to sort of make room for you. Um, and so that's part of the idea of the exchange program is to um, give you the opportunity to both see what it's like when the emergency doctors actually do everything and also particularly in the simulation lab um, to give you much more hands-on specific procedural training to get you much more comfortable with procedures like particularly intubation to take that home and the next time an intubation comes up, you know, you can speak up and say, listen, I feel confident. I know how to do this. Let me try. And when they see that you actually are competent, things, people's minds start to change. And that's the idea is to start getting over that hurdle. It's not an easy thing to do. Um, so I'm going to open that question up to the Italians. Um, if you have any insight about these sort of turf wars and 
how do you get recognition and what's your experience been? Yeah, I, I'm actually targeting to the, for example, well, the airways and is something small, but we are talking about orthopedia, try to take care of all the patients. Something that is actually quite dangerous because yeah. sometimes they have really complicated patients without no training in those patients, just the structure. Do you understand what I mean? Yes, yeah, so. I do. So either Michaela, Leticia, or um, Bruno, if you would like to try to address that question a little bit. Hi, I'm Letizia. Um, uh, I feel uh, exactly the same way here in Italy uh, about um, the anesthesiology school uh, or, or other specialties that uh, don't let us do something that uh, is our too. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, but uh, maybe the others, uh, the other colleagues, can um, offer you another point of view because um, I can I come from uh, Sicily, uh, where the school is new, or uh, newer than other than others, and uh, our figure is um, I don't know I can I can I can say that. Um, we have not a lot of consideration from other colleagues from other schools. So um, every other um, uh, every other kind of, co of colleague uh, thinks that we are not able to do anything anything special like uh, simple um, procedures or other things. Uh, other things, for example, also um, uh, the management of airways. Uh, I, I think it's not too complicated sometimes, but <laughs> um, um, I understand what you just said, Lexi. Uh, perhaps if they uh, can see us really confident with that, uh, prepared, um, um, talking about uh, indication, content indications, uh, uh, every detail we need to know about um, um, also tools we need, of course. Uh, maybe they, <laughs> they let us do everything we want. Um, I know that um, the anesthesiology school in Italy, or my, uh, I must say in Sicily, uh, because <laughs> the Italy is really is a really small country, but um, from region to region they are really big different. So um, in my city, um, I think they are afraid of us. I don't know. I can say that uh, because uh, they can. Perhaps they can smell our energy, our, um, um, I don't know, our, yeah. you understand, yes. So uh, maybe um, if we can, um, before do, if we can talk with them about that, uh, maybe they let us do everything we want. Because before the action, there is uh, a call. Uh, sorry, I'm this. I I have this patient here. I need you, but or maybe I need you only because I'm going to intubate it, intubate it him or her, so I can manage it <laughs> only for this. But uh, we have to do this call. So uh, doing this uh, from that moment to their arrival, uh, we can we can. Talk. We can explain our motivations and everything. So maybe they can trust us. And that's kind of what I was talking about earlier with relationships. I think that um, rather than seeing other specialists as you know rivals or enemies, I think we need to reframe our thinking and make relationships with the specialties that we need to help us be more independent. We need anesthesia to help train residents to learn how to intubate well, but they're not going to do that if they don't have good relationships with emergency departments and emergency physicians. And so, you know, I've had this advice given to me, and I'll give it to you as well. Personal relationships make a big difference. 
Ask someone how they are. Say hello. Have lunch with them. Make a relationship. So the next time you need to call anesthesia because you're intubating a patient, you call them and say, hey, I have this patient I need to intubate. And they'll say, cool, good, good luck. Call me if you need me. You know, and eventually you get that independence with that respect. And I think it's all built through relationships. All right. Looks like our, our presentation is working. I'm going to hand it over to our Italian team. Okay. Thank you. So um, we, we really want to talk um, and to have a brief talk about emergency medicine in Italy um, from the foundation uh, till nowadays. So um, Bruno, please change the, the slide. Okay. Thank you. So, um, as you already know, emergency medicine is a novel specialty in Europe, and in Italy it was founded in 2009. We at first had uh, 50 places, uh, plus 32 extra places um, from a private hospital found in it. So, a total of just 82 residents in 2009. Um, our program, our um, traineeship, uh, contemplates five-year training, and it is articulated in uh, rotation in clinical activities and um, academic lessons. These rotations are in uh, several different uh, departments, but we are we are going to talk about later. So, in 2014, we had our first emergency medicine specialists in our country. So it was um, uh, like um, a good thing for us. And um, uh, before uh, the foundation, you know, emergency medicine um, wasn't um, at all present in Italy, but uh, there was a high request from the um, health uh, ministry and um, from, especially from uh, our scientific societies like CIMEO and uh, Achem and Lexi, or, of course, she knows CIMEO. And before this uh, Emergency Medicine School Foundation, uh, who was working in the emergency department? Well, um, there were and there still are doctors uh, with degree in internal medicine and equivalent qualification, but there are surgeons and other doctors with mm, not degree, um, like only the bachelor in, in medicine. And um, in many emergency departments, those figures are still very present. Uh, so these colleagues are still working in our emergency department um, in, in Italy, and it, it is not compulsory to be emergency medicine specialist to work in uh, emergency department in Italy. Um, but uh, if I am a student uh, in medicine, what I, what do I have to do to to get in in this program? So after the graduation in medicine, um, we we have to do uh, difficult exams. I think it's um, quite the same in all the country, but uh, here in Italy, uh, based on the ranking of this of this exam, uh, the candidates choose um, which residency they can do. So um, everybody is um, competing for uh, a place. Uh, uh, as you know, in every uh, kind of residency program, and only uh, the good rate uh, people can choose um, a lot of kind of um, residency programs. So, uh, about uh, emergency medicine traineeship, um, there are often less. Um, um, they are the the last one to be chosen. And often uh, there are less places available compared to the number of candidates. So every year, some colleagues do not enter at all in any residence program. Uh, so um, nowadays, uh, Bruno changed the. Thank you. <laughs> nowadays. We count more than 2,000 uh, residents in Italy. Uh, we have school in 33 universities, 
um, all over the country, and um, the numbers of scholarships are increased in the last few years, especially in the last few years, and it is due to the pandemic, because the COVID pandemic highlighted the lack of doctors in the emergency department. I think, I think that uh, this problem was the problem of every country in the world in these two years, but um, in Italy it was very uh, present as um, a bad problem, and um, despite uh, HIAM training is um, based on the core curriculum made by EUSEM, so the European core curriculum, um, there are many differences among this university, among this specialty school in Italy, and this is a very um, uh, important problem for us. Um, that's why we, uh, as COSMEO, decided to do a survey um, each year in, in order to understand better um, and um, have data from our um, residents all over the, the country. And uh, this is um, a survey made it in 2021 uh, from us. Uh, by us, sorry. <laughs> and from this, um, from from this data, we understood that we were, of course, we were growing, and uh, we had this um, distribution uh, of residents, of resident residents in Italy. And you know, you can see from the, in the north of Italy, there are lots, um, many residents down in the south. Um, and in the islands, of course, the um, Sardinia and Sicily in the back. Um, the problem was um, that our um, curriculum and our five-year training is not uh, standardized, it's not regular, to, and it's not the same for anyone. Um, in the country. So um, there are many differences and uh, from this survey we understood that um, a lot of um, residents were doing different um, time and different kind of uh, period and rotation, like uh, in terms of months in different departments. For example, um, in the emergency department, in internal medicine department, and in especially uh, the main differences were in the um, ICU, um, operative theater, and um, the pre-hospital rotations. Um, you can see here in this graph that um, a lot of people um, uh, have some of these rotations not even planned, and more uh, of these uh, rotation are less than three months. Um, our job as um, association of um, residents is to improve, uh, monitor, and enhance uh, the standardized training, and of course to promote high quality education. Um, we also have uh, a very important interest in sponsorship of intern international exchange programs. And that's why in 2017, uh, our um, predecessors uh, decided to um, start this collaboration with uh, Chicago universities and especially with um, Lexi uh, in order to have our uh, Italian residents um, moving and um, uh, obtain experience, education, and um, research experience in other countries in order to see how other countries uh, teach emergency medicine. Um, so we. Sorry. Um, we had this. Mm, survey mm, and we highlight all the these differences. Um, we 
we are at the moment, for example, I am attending my pre-hospital care rotation, but I am I'm fortunate to do it uh, for uh, two months. Uh, but we have uh, like the 40 percent of us that have less than three months of this rotation, and people that, as I was saying before, uh, they haven't at all. Um, uh, we have another um, important problem uh, about uh, the um, airway experience, uh, like in the ICU and in intensive care department. Um, a lot of Italian trainees uh, does not have any um, um, time of rotation in these um, places, and um, it's very strange, but. 80% of uh, Italian trainee, trainees um, stay in the emergency department less than six months. The place where they are going to work and they stay less than six months. Um, I am um, leaving the word Bruno to, to do the other part of this presentation now. Yeah. I hope that uh, everybody uh, is uh, listening. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Uh, so let's see other uh, red flags that uh, um, we, we have seen about uh, emergency medicine uh, uh, resident program uh, based on our data of the national survey. And uh, let's see how often uh, we, we have classes and uh, by our data uh, it is show that uh, more or less the 50% of us have classes um, one, one, once per month or even less than one per month. That's obviously uh, not really uh, <laughs> in, a, in a way to, to improve uh, emergency medicine. And also regarding the simulation, this is a core, um, a core point in our program, in this program. Uh, we can see that uh, one fifth of uh, the all Italian emergency medicine residents do not have access uh, to simulations. And what about the skills? We asked our uh, our residents in the fourth and fifth year, just before finishing the, the residency, uh, how ca can they manage and. Uh, if uh, they, they feel strong enough uh, to manage a medical emergency or surgical emergency or a cardiac arrest. And uh, um, we can see for the medical and cardiac arrest, they feel uh, enough competence. For the surgical emergency, less. Uh, they are from uh, sufficient, decent, insufficient. And also the practical skills, they, they feel uh, independently. Uh, I don't know, to, to put a central vein line or to perform local anesthesia or uh, electrical cardiovascular or uh, sedation, but uh, uh, less uh, ready to perform a thoracic drain or a cast uh, in a, on a broken uh, bro bone or uh, to perform a, a delivery. Uh, also in the ultrasound, uh, they they told us that uh, they lack, uh, they have uh, lack, uh, they feel uh, insufficiently ready to perform a cardiac uh, ultrasound or abdominal or vascular ultrasound, but they are quite ready uh, on the lungs ultrasound. I think that uh, also the COVID has a, a big role in this uh, because uh, all of us, uh, we perform the really uh, a lot of uh, lung ultrasound during that, uh, that moment. And also for uh, not uh, intensive uh, ventilation, not invasive uh, ventilation, uh, it's more or less uh, they consider decent to manage it, uh, not really decent, more sufficient or insufficient, that excellence. So uh, the main lacks are uh, to manage uh, gynecological and uh, pediatric urgence by our data. And uh, uh, another problem of the emergency department uh, in Italy is that uh, um, after COVID, the educational ministry 
has uh, more than double uh, the places of uh, emergency medicine uh, residency program, but uh, around 40% of total number of uh, uh, places available in uh, 2021 uh, were uh, lost because uh, people choose don't didn't choose them, choose uh, other specialization or to do not get into uh, any specialization at all. We believe uh, uh, this choice is not due for the lack uh, inside uh, the, um, the educational pro program in uh, residency, uh, because e even if we have, uh, and uh, as we saw just now, we have a lot of lack, um, but we are uh, happy of uh, to have uh, this uh, program, and uh, as Cosmeo, we are working much to, to get better uh, in in the future, but uh, uh, the main the main uh, um, the main problem is to the working condition of uh, overcrowded emergency department, a uh, much higher risk to uh, to be uh, sweet, uh, especially uh, compared of our words, uh, much lower salaries and. Uh, Sometimes uh, they don't respect uh, rest uh, condition and the overtime that uh, we spent in emergency department uh, is not paid more. And uh, uh, there is also not uh, respect, uh, for example, for uh, holidays because of the lack of uh, people, uh, of colleagues that work in emergency department. We are uh, really... Uh, uh, under the, num the minimal number, so uh, people cannot get on holiday at the same time. And uh, how our schools handle with uh, this increase of uh, scholarship? Uh, a lot of uh, um, a lot of uh, colleagues uh, told us that uh, uh, the university was not able. To, to cope with uh, this uh, really aument of uh, uh, places, but uh, we we trust in emergency medicine program. For 63% uh, of us, uh, for emergency medicine was our first choice in uh, in the exam. We did the exam uh, to do emergency medicine, and for 25% uh, it was not a first choice, but now they are. Uh, happy to do emergency medicine. They discovered emergency medicine and they like it. And uh, for the future, uh, we, we stressed before uh, that we don't do enough, uh, um, uh, enough ro rotation in pre-hospital care, also because uh, more than 50% of us uh, in the future we would like uh, to work uh, between hospital and pre-hospital care, so uh, do uh, a part of uh, uh, of uh, our working hours in emergency department or subintensive care unit, and a part uh, like in uh, in pre-hospital cares. And uh, we know that uh, this is uh, emergency medicine in Italy has. Uh, uh, it's very difficult and uh, it's uh, uh, uphill, really uh, uphill, but on the top we, we can found emergency medicine that uh, has been uh, defined as the most interesting 15 minutes of every specialty and uh, we think uh, uh, it's, it's, we have to work uh, to go in this direction so we really uh, care and about this program and we want this program very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I don't know now how to... Thank you, guys. Continue. All right. You may see I'm in a different location. We are now in our sim lab. Um, thank you to everyone from Italy who helped prepare and no. present that wonderful talk. Uh, it was very, very useful, informative. I hope that the people from other countries got the sense that okay. I'm hoping you will get, which is you are not alone. This affects everyone, and that's why we're doing this together. Um, I don't know how to to get. That's okay. Um, we're gonna switch to a different presenter. So, um, Michaela, okay. if you could give uh, the Stim Lab presentation co-presenter. Um, so I am. We're gonna jump right into simulations. We're running a couple minutes late. We'll catch up. That's my fault. 
Um, okay. So Italy, since they got to do our country of the month, is going to be our hot seat. But you get a little break. Um, so before we get your simulation case, we're going to have uh, some awesome volunteers from the University of Chicago residency who are standing here behind me, waiting in the wings, um, to show you a case. So they're going to show you um, a, an example of a simulation case that they're going to run and show for you. And then we're going to have some time after the first case to do what's called a debrief. A debrief is considered by most the most important part of simulation. That's when we talk about what we did and what we think and talk about you know, what we would do differently, what we've learned, the key points. So I'm going to send it over to SimLab. Um, Residents, come on in. I'll let you guys introduce yourselves, and then we'll change the presenter to SimLab. Come on over. For the University of Chicago residents, I'm Mika. I'm a third-year resident. I'm Taylor. I'm also a third-year resident. And I'm Tito. I'm a second-year resident. All right. So I'm going to go sit in the control room and turn off this camera, and we're going to take it from this. Can everyone hear and see in the sim lab? No, actually the sound is really bad. Okay. Is that better now for the sound? Give me a thumbs up if that's a better sound quality. Can you guys hear me? No. Okay. Um, Still can't hear. Okay, hold on. We'll get it fixed. I think they can't hear very well. Okay. How does it sound now? Is it still too low? I can hear okay. All right, so... We'll leave it like this. If you're having trouble hearing us, just message us in the chat and we'll try to adjust. We'll try to talk real loud, okay? I want to introduce one more person over here. What was that? Oh. Um, this is Jared. Jared in the Great Scrubs. He is, oh, there's me. He's our... Yes. He's our assistant program director for the University of Chicago Residency, and he will be our nurse today. Yes. Right. I'm going to leave the debrief also.
How about now? Can you hear me now? That's better. Except that it's, I'm going to turn that one off. Yeah. Turn off. How about now? That's better. All right. Okay. All right. All right. Let's get started. <coughs> Okay, I think we should be good. Great. All right, so I will give you a little bit of background on this case, and then I will be pretending to be the patient also. So pretend my voice is different and it sounds like this. So this is a 36-year-old female who is an anthropologist who just returned from an excavation in Western China one week ago. She has a history of asthma. She takes Simbacort and Seasonique, which is a birth control. She has no other surgical history, no allergies, and here she is. All right, so uh, can we get her on the monitor? Yeah, we can get an ID and then you can get a history please from her. Sure. Hi, ma'am. I'm Dr. Kochman. This is the rest of the ER team. Can you tell us what brought you to the ER today? Oh, hi. Um, nice well, to meet you. On that. She looks like she's hypoxic, so let's put her on a uh, four liters nasal cannula, please, and then get an EKG because she's tachycardic. Sure thing. Yeah, so I've been feeling kind of short of breath. Um, I just got back from this trip. It was awesome. We were, like, digging for dinosaur bones and stuff, but ever since I got back, I just haven't been feeling right, and it's been going on for, like, a week, so I figured I'd come in today. I mean, I have asthma, but this is kind of different because it seems, seems like it's not going away. I mean, I tried using my inhaler um, and just doesn't really do anything. Here's your EKG. Okay, so EKG, sinus, tack, um, and about rate of 130. Um, normal axis, normal intervals. I don't see any um, FT elevation or depression, so sinus, tack. Um, and then when we listen to breath sounds, is there anything abnormal? Nope, normal. Uh, Mika, we can keep getting a history, and then let's get an ultrasound at the bedside, too. Ultrasound's here. We can pull out pictures when you need them. Nope. Are you having any chest pain? No, not really pain. It's just, it's just like, hard to take a deep breath. Sure. And you, um, are you, is that feeling worse when you get up and you walk around? Yeah, I guess kind of. When I was going up the stairs earlier, I had to stop like halfway, which is weird, because I've never had to do that before. I'm pretty active. Okay. Any swelling in your legs? Actually, when you mentioned it, um, yeah, I, I did kind of notice that. I thought I just strained it, uh, but my left leg's been kind of hurting, actually. So here's a cardiac uh, ultrasound that's pretty representative of what you see throughout your scan. There's no effusion on a different study or a different uh, uh, view. Okay. And, um, I don't see a marker for the probe orientation, but RV, LV. Um, so on this echo, it looks like RV is dilated, um, which with the rest of it, at least preliminarily, we get more concerned for a pulmonary embolism. Yeah. I have an IV, and it's really loud. Working what's that? Yes. We can get a CBC, a BMP, a troponin, um, a BNP, and then the chest x-ray as well, too. Okay. So, ma'am, one thing we're worried about is whether or not you have a blood clot in your lungs, um, or maybe in your leg that's kind of gone to your lungs. Um, do you have any family history of any medical problems? Not that I know of. Okay, are you allergic to anything? No. Other than the Simbacort and the Seasonique, do you take any other medicines? Once in a while, I take, you know, allergy medicine or, like, ibuprofen, but nothing else every day. Okay, and then other than the asthma, do you have any medical history? Not really, no. Okay, do you drink any alcohol? Once in a while. Do you smoke cigarettes? Never. Have you ever used any drugs? Cocaine, ecstasy, 
No, no, definitely not. I work for the government. Okay. I have to ask everyone, okay? Sure, um, I understand. How are you feeling now? Um, honestly, I'm kind of feeling a little bit worse since I got here. Uh, I was okay, but after I walked in from the parking lot, I kind of started to feel more short of breath. And she's still hypoxic, 91 to some four liters. Um, so we can try going up to six liters, but next move, do you think high flow? Is she working? Oh, I don't, I don't feel so good. I don't feel so good. <laughs> okay. Um, and then, do you want to start to answer heparin yeah. for her? Yeah. So we have a pretty high suspicion for PE. We're going to start a heparin drip with a bullet. Yeah. Okay. Oh, what is that? What is it? Oh. Ma'am, are you still with us? Ma'am? Ma'am. You're awake. Uh, uh, All right. So we got um, so it looks like she's going to have high... No, I don't feel full. Okay. So let's start compression. Um, so keto compression, Mika on airway. Um, and then can we get Epi 1 milligram hold up, please? And then also, given that we're concerned that this is a PE, can we get TPA hold up? TPA? Come on. Um, I would can we call pharmacy and some sort of Okay, I can do that. Your Epi. It's probably pharmacy. Oh yeah, um, I have a patient that we want to give him here at uh, TPA four. Uh, That'd be one milligram in. I had a PA or actually want to convert the dose. Can we give him that? Uh, yeah, for PE. 50 on under that. Okay, got it. Can I have a PDM ready? Nope, that's yep, a PDM. Yep, that's a PDM. Okay, so, um, Tarsi said 50 to 100 milligrams, so let's pull, uh, let's just pull up 100 and get 50. And then... 100 of, uh... You said a hundred? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then can someone please tell me when the uh, 10 seconds of pulse drip, please? We are 30 seconds of pulse check. I have a hundred of PPA. Okay. Ready to push? Um, what do you think? Should we wait for pulse check and see if we can get back? Or I don't think there's any change or anything for us. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So, do you can push? Yeah. Okay, so let's get 100 of TPA push. 100 of TPA push. We are 10 seconds to pulse check. All right. Um, can we charge with that, please? Sure. Um, to, and then, and then I can take over compression for you guys. Yeah. Okay. I'll try it. Mm -hmm. um, okay, all right. We'll charge. Do we have a pulse? I'm not ready to pulse. I have no femoral pulse. It looks like a systole on the monitor, so we're doing compression. Um, all right, so we pushed TPA. We're most concerned that this person was doing a PE that caused their hypoxic arrest. Is there any other thoughts, other therapies when we go for HSMT that it could be? We didn't see an effusion. We had good breath sounds. We had less concern for attention, pneumo. Um, I think that too is in the right place. Um, so we can check. I do hear my layover at them. Okay. Yes. Good bilateral breath sounds. Um, so we don't think it's an infusion, we don't think it's a tension pneumo, um, we're most concerned with PE, we already gave TPA. Um, we are 30 seconds from our next pulsing, pulsing rhythm check, okay. which will be and four then, minutes from our happy. Okay, so we can get another one happy ready. Um, so we need to continue compression for circulating the TPA, then we can also consider calm or FOT. Yeah. Um, to put it on the next one. Okay, um, so we can... Get uh, cat lab um, for possible ECMO activation. 
I have the message here ready. We're at uh, we are now at two minutes. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, we're the pulse check. Um, yeah. So, we can just pause for pulse check. Um, it looks like sinus tack on the monitor. I do have a couple of femoral pulse. Um, so can we get... Do we, do we palpate a femoral pulse? Yeah, I have one. I have one. Okay. Do you want that up here or no? Uh, no. Okay. Um, so we have confirmed uh, femoral pulse. Let's get a post rest EKG. And then also they're hypotensive, so let's get levofen um, to hang. And then we still call the cath lab for ECMO. And case. Good job, guys. So tell me one second. Thanks, guys. Mm. <laughs> No one needs to know that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Great job. Okay. We're back. They did a great job. We gave a virtual round of applause for our residents today. All right. We're going to have a little easy uh, with Jared. And then it'll be get ready because you're up next. Okay. So, um, before we get into this, I should just mention that these debrief sessions can be varying length. Sometimes they're longer, sometimes they're shorter. We're going to make this short to give you guys an example of some of the questions we've asked and the ways we go about debriefing these cases, but not in as much depth as we might on a normal, normal case. Now, I guess first things first, you know, as, as a little, you know, as a little bit of an outside, as a little bit of an outside observer, um, what, walking away from the case, how, how, what are your initial initial rapid reactions? I think uh, high suspicion for PE from the get go. I think they did a good job getting there pretty early on. Uh, recent travel, uh, young female on birth control. Uh, we saw that she had unilateral leg swelling. Um, she had some sort of suppress. So I think, you know, big thing uh, that I also appreciated was they got an ultrasound quickly and noticed that right ventricular strain, um, which, you know, is at least for me, uh, PE and movement otherwise, especially in a young female like this. With no, right. There's no reason, no, yeah, history. no reason she should have that appearance on her ultrasound. Now, um, Taylor, why don't you take us through a little bit? With Tito you know, hit on a couple of his, um, a couple of the high points. But what other things were going through your mind in terms of differential diagnosis? Right, PE seemed like the big, uh, uh, clear-cut thing. But what other things do you think of when you're seeing a patient like this? Um, I think in the beginning, when it was just she was coming in shortness of breath, chest pain, tacky, hypoxic. PE, but then you also think about things like uh, like a pneumonia. Um, I don't think you guys gotten a sense, but that might um, push you more towards an infectious etiology. Also, pneumothorax could do it as well too. Um, and then peripheral effusion, a little bit lower, but I'm also thinking that as well too. Um, and then otherwise, like any other. Like a peripheritis. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Asthma. And then maybe asthma or like um, a nuance of heart failure, um, also atypical ACF too. Um, so nuance of like heart failure is something like myocarditis. In a young patient, yeah. myocarditis. Yeah, with like recent travel too. Okay. Um, and, and so you went about gathering information and your ultrasound was very helpful as it is in a lot of these kind of undifferentiated but seemingly unstable patients. You start with the nasal cannula oxygen in response to the hypoxemia. Tell me about that. Did that, did that do anything for you guys? Um, yeah, I think we, I think initially we were like in the low 80s, and then we maybe got to like the high 80s. Um, we probably would have kept titrating it up. Um, 
you know, one thing that's been is that you have to ask whether or not the patient is having difficulty breathing, like work with breathing. Um, and so I think if we had known that earlier, we might have escalated to something like a high flow okay. to be able to handle it earlier. Yeah, we do lose some of that just nonverbal cues from these mannequins that we see in our patients with diaphoresis or personal breathing or his overall work of breathing. So those are good things to ask about. Um, now, she, you, were, you guys were entertaining the PE diagnosis. Were she not to decompensate, what would be the next couple of things you would do? You sent some blood work, which I think is an appropriate set of blood work. What other things would you look at doing? I think from a respiratory standpoint, that was like our next junction um, because he was still pretty hypoxic despite the low flow nasal cannula. So we were talking about a high flow nasal cannula or bypass um, would be the next best step. If we were thinking PE, I think like bypass is going to be less helpful because there's not really like anything um, like fluid or something like a, from a positive pressure ventilation perspective that would help and I think it could actually hurt. Um, so I think probably we would have done high flow. Chest x-ray and then we would have, uh, I think our physician was high enough that we talked about starting the here Keprin with the bolus and then um, if stabilized would have gone to the CT scanner to confirm the diagnosis, but yeah. obviously right now right. she wants to be able to do that. I think, yeah, this is one of those situations where you like a confirmatory study. You like that CT angiogram or CTP protocol study. Um, but sometimes the patient's condition doesn't allow you to get that study that you really want, right? So in, in, I agree, in cases with a really high suspicion, try and have to start stabilization. In this case, she went into uh, cardiac arrest and you had to empirically give that lytic, um, which was the right, right choice in this situation. Um, there are there are patient populations, you know, that that's a much more difficult decision, right? An elderly patient where you're thinking this could be acute coronary syndrome presenting atypically, or this could be an aortic pathology, which you really do not want to give that lytic to. And, and, and you know, it'll be, it'll be really difficult to do that because many of them don't have a normal looking heart on an ultrasound anyway. So you lose those kind of touch points because it's much more complicated to take. It's much more difficult. Um, and so, and so you went through and, and you know, she went into cardiac arrest, you intubated, uh, we gave two rounds of epinephrine, I think, mm -hmm. okay, and, and pushed that 100 of TPA, yeah. which is the right dose for most patients this size. It's a, it's a very small patient, you might think less, you know, less of a dose, but 100 is an easy, one is easy to remember. That's the name for kids, you know, like they just don't know. It's, it's one per kilo. Okay. Yeah, it's one per kilo. If, if it's a small patient, I mean, you can go down as low as 50, or we can do less than 50, because then you're talking pediatric patients. Okay. Not something that's occurring in the vast majority of people. It, it, with, you know, heat of the moment, don't have an accurate way, need to give something because the patient's actively dying in front of you, 100 is an easy number to remember. Okay. It's an easy, it's an easy, it, it's the viable basically for the nurses to draw to it to have it quick. Okay. So that's an okay default. Okay. Um, there wasn't much in terms of, I, 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 one thing I really liked was your communication, closing communication. There wasn't a lot of talking over one another. Your roles were fairly well defined, which was good. You were kind of keeping track of all the initial parts, and then you were running the case, and you could handle the procedures, and then there was some collaboration on on what you said. So that was good. A lot of times when you have many providers in the room, it can get very complicated. People talk over one another, and that communication can get uh, lost to the nurse. But I, I felt like I knew everything that was going on in terms of what you guys needed and so forth. So um, any other thoughts from your perspective? I think SIM is one of the unique circumstances, at least for us, where we work with other providers who are at the same like, level as us, like with our peers, um, as opposed to usually we're used to working alone with an attending. Um, and so I think designating those roles is helpful because it's very easy for, like you said, people to talk over each other um, or like to try to do everything and then you get um, kind of duplicative things. So finding those roles and then kind of trying to stick to them is very helpful. Yeah, and I think any 
um, getting them on the monitor right away, um, then any abnormal vital sign, um, acting on it right away while um, your other team member who you assigned a role to is getting the history and stuff. So seeing that they're hypoxic, um, putting them on oxygen, seeing that they're tachycardic, getting EKG, so like starting those things, whoever the leader is, um, while they're still ongoing getting the history, which is true that real life too. Right, I think that, that, that you know, parallel process or two things going on simultaneously is an important idea, especially yeah. in this case, right? Because you're simultaneously trying to do things to help them and do things to figure out what the root cause is. And those, that does converge at some point on an actual diagnosis and a, and a non-impaired treatment. But very often in our initial 20 minutes with a patient or what have you, we don't know what's going on, yeah. right? So we have to, number one, think about things we can do to try and stabilize and treat them and allow ourselves the, the time to get back to you know, getting lab work back, getting imaging results back, getting some concrete data and, and getting that definitive study. So that idea of treating and working out going on at the same time is something that I think is, is fairly, you know, you need to critical situations, right? Yeah. In, in, in many, many, many of our cases, we're saying, okay, well, this could be appendicitis, or it could be, let's get some tests, let's get your CAT scan and take a look, and once we know what we're dealing with, we'll be able we'll, we'll act appropriately. In this case, we don't have the time to do this. We have to do both at the same time. Mm -hmm. And when you have multiple providers, it's really easy. When you're the only person, you know, working at night, you know, or, or what have you, in mm -hmm. next year when you're on your own, <laughs> um, you're going to have to do both of those things at the same time. I think this is a good situation of practices. Yeah. Um, if I can just chime in, I agree. I think um, I'll stand on camera. One of the um, most important aspects to me that is what I wanted you guys out there to see is um, how when you're doing simulation in a situation like this in the sim lab and you have an actual person who you can obviously intubate, it can be, you know, you can be cyanotic, you have pulses, you have things that is more, that's the whole idea of skin, that is more like real life. You can actually practice those skills versus just talking about a case or something. It's very different having something to touch and have in front of you and have the opportunity to make mistakes. And that's the idea. Do it the wrong way on a piece of plastic before you do it the wrong way on a person. And I agree, I think you guys did a good job of communicating and that's the other really important skill that we want people to really pay attention to, um, especially those of you from other places, is look, you see how they communicate, clear roles, you know, everyone knows what they're doing so that you can work effectively together. I think if I may, one last thing from Sim that I've learned to appreciate is uh, having to speak everything out loud as well. A lot of the times in real life, you know, nursing is great and starts doing stuff without you asking. Uh, but sometimes, because no one's perfect, they may make a mistake, maybe they're not on, you know, we don't have them on telly or something like that, so we don't actually have them hooked up. But practicing saying everything out loud uh, makes it so that when a situation like this happens, that's, you turn to that, make sure it's actually placed, make sure that, you know, nursing has done what they're there to do and not, you know, trying to get lines or something. So yeah, create good habits, practice like you play. Use a sports analogy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so in every simulation case that we do, um, we have what are called critical actions. So these are the, the focus points, you know, things we want people to take away from the case, and you have to do all of the critical actions to pass the case. So in this case, the four critical actions were um, start oxygen by nasal cannula, which they did right away, start the workup with labs, which we got, chest x-ray, and then eventually a CT, which the patient was too unstable, then intubate the patient and start ACLS when they went into arrest, and then administer the TTA with the high suspicion for PE. And all of those things were done. So good job, guys. All right. All right. So you guys are, you want to stick around and watch? Uh, we're going to do one more case in Italy. Get your cameras on, get your microphones on, because you're up. So, um, so, you, you, you guys are all set. You can go Thank you very say much. whatever you want. I owe you guys all coffee, okay? Next time you see me. All right. So, Italy, here's what we're doing. Um, you, we're going to pretend like this is a facility that does telemedicine, okay? You guys are remote. You are our telehealth doctors. 
we're going to be your hands and eyes and ears and everything else, and you're going to tell us what you want us to do. You can talk to the patient, and um, they'll talk to you, and you can ask for anything you want us to do or get for you. That's, you know, where are your eyes and ears and hands, okay? So um, give me one minute, get yourself ready, and I'll tell you when we're going to start. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, by the way, guys, um, this is Anik. I'm the one that was kind of typing the abbreviations. Um, if you have any more questions, definitely feel free to let me know. Um, I know some of you are familiar with how we kind of talk in medical English, uh, I guess, lingo or slang. But yeah, definitely happy to help. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, from how many hours do you are you experiencing pain? Um, I would say the last like you know the last eight hours maybe. Like I, you know I got back from my trip and I was fine and then last night I went to bed and I was fine but I woke up and my leg was hurting so then I I I I stayed home and then I decided to go in because it hurt worse. Okay, so um, nurse and doctor, uh, we would like to monitor the patient, have a venous, intravenous access, and have some news about his um, ECG and uh, oxygen status. When was your last dive before the flight? How many hours before? Sorry, we couldn't hear you. Eight hours is when I started feeling pain. Yeah, yeah, but how many hours uh, before the flight did you do your last uh, uh, diving? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. How many hours before the flight was your last dive adventure? Oh, before then? Um, before the last trip, it was I went diving like three days ago. Okay, I think we need to support oxygen. Yeah. with oxygen. Yes, he. Um, do you smoke cigarettes? No. Okay. So, um, yeah, we need oxygen. Um, do you have? Uh, um, what kind of oxygen 
Yeah, um, Venturi mask, you know, I don't know in English the name of yeah. it. <laughs> exactly. Uh, the mask. Um, um, uh, not only the nose one, just the the mouth and uh, nose one, yeah? Yes, the mask. Uh, with, uh, mm, I think, 40% uh, of... Yes. 40% of oxygen. Uh, uh, it's with uh, the breather, so okay, it's, it's okay, it's fine. Um, and uh, uh, can uh, we do a uh, blood gas? Is it possible? We'll do a uh, blood gas. Arterial bl blood gas? Okay. On monitor, I see a, a sinus tachycardia, I guess. Um, uh, does the patient have fever or the temperature is high? Yeah, so we put a oral and it's low. Yeah. And then it's a temperature which is about 39. Okay. Oh, okay. We need to, to give him paracetamol, of course. One one gram and uh, and the the blood pressure is over the um, one hundred twenty nine. Okay, it's good. Okay. Can there some doctor can can the people that are helping see the screen? I think you might be blocking it. I don't know. Sorry. It's okay. I just want to make sure that they can see. Okay, I'm giving the paracetamol now. Okay. Okay, thank you. At, at the uh, arterial blood gas, is uh, he, uh, I don't know, uh, hypercapnic or something? Yes, uh, because we actually have to send that to the lab. So that might take Okay. A okay. Is there, is, do you want to, do you want to, do you want us to look at any other part of the patient? Do you want to do any more of an exam? Yeah. Oh, yeah, please. Uh, uh, auscultation. What's that? Yeah, I would like to see the leg. The leg, okay. Zoom in on the screen. Wow, why does my leg look like that? <laughs> okay, um, uh, so it's um, the the pulse of the feet is present, isn't it? Is the pulse present on the feet? Yes, he has, he has pulses. Okay. okay. Is it uh, warmer than the other one? Yeah. Oh, actually, it's too hard to breathe. I don't know why my voice sounds like this. Well, it's been hard to breathe. He he he's suffering from that. This mayor, I, I think now. It looks like it looks like his tongue is swollen. His lips and his tongue look like they're getting kind of swollen. You know, his his oxygen is kind of sir. He's not answering. Yeah. Yeah. He is going to shock. So no, we need to. Uh, I think he will lose consciousness of the patient. So okay, uh, we need to take care of his um, highways. Please do something uh, like if you feel comfortable in um, intubation. Yeah, do it now, please. 
and um, do we still have the pulse? I, I can't hear you. Anyway, uh, okay. So now we we yeah, star CPR. Um, did you intubate him? I'm ready. Is that okay? Yes, intubate him. Okay. Thank you. Um. How is the rhythm of presentation for the moment? Yeah, we have a... I, I can't he hear you very much, but uh, if the rhythm is... How is the, the monitor? I can't really uh, see from here. I, is the rhythm uh, shockable or, uh, or not? The patient is intubated now. Thank you. Okay. We're going to put on the other monitor. Thank you. Okay, so prepare. Yes, one, one gram of epi, please. Can we do? Uh, can we perform a um, eco scan of the heart, please? That was an echo. Yeah. Oh, I think my receiver broke it. We don't have an ultrasound today. Okay, I'm giving up. Okay. Okay, that's enough for today. Okay, what else do you want to do? What do you think is wrong with this guy? What's going on? Well, um, I think uh, embolism uh, may be due to the to the uh, to the dive before and the leg. Michela. Well, I, I can't hear very much. I I hear one word and three known. Anyway, uh, yeah, I think the same, quite the same. Um, Unfortunately, uh, we didn't ask for uh, coagulations and uh, the other um, lab exams, so we, we we do not have any information about that. But do we have a poll? I cannot read uh, really here very well now. What medication do you have? 
medication you want to give? Any medicine you want to give? My brother, what happened? What's going on? Why is he like this? Are you are you his brother? I am his brother. We just oh. went on a trip. Oh. Yeah, so we went on a trip like about three days ago and we just got back. I know he had brushed up against something and he got like a something on his leg. He like he hurt his leg somehow. And I told him to go to the doctor in the Bahamas, but he said, I don't trust it, I'm not going. So he said I'm fine. It was a little red all around, so then we just flew back home. And then I guess she had to go to the hospital. They called me, so I'm here. Okay. Well, yeah, so we're, we're trying to figure out what's going on. Um, it, it, you know, there's a few possibilities, but it looks like whatever was happening made him very, very sick, and his heart actually stopped for a few minutes. Oh, no. But we actually got it started again. So okay. That's good. We're going to keep working to find out what's wrong and treat the problem. Okay. Hey, doctors, uh, telehealth doctors, do you have any questions for this man's brother? Does he have any allergies? Uh, no, he's not allergic. He's not allergic, though. Again? He's, he's, he's diabetic. diabetic. Okay. Yeah, no, I think he didn't, I think he hurt himself on the leg. Sorry? He? He, he rubbed against something in the ocean when we were scuba diving on his leg. Okay. So that's why we didn't go to the hospital until now. Like, do you know what? I don't know. I was swimming further away from him, and he was behind me, so I didn't see what he, what he did with his leg. Okay. I think we should start with antibiotics for the moment and check about this t his uh, temperature and his blood pressure. Do we need to stabilize stabilize his um, blood pressure or not? Uh, what about his blood pressure and what antibiotics do you want? Um, I, I don't know what are we... Um, um, maybe doxycycline because you have the. I don't know if you have the same. <laughs> Do you want us to give him anything for his blood pressure? Yes. Uh, how much is it? Right now it's 69 over 59. 69? 69 over 59. Okay, um, I think we can start with um, um, 500 uh, millimeter of uh, fluids and check later if it's not going well we are going to help with uh, noradrenaline okay okay i'll give 500 milliliters of normal pill uh, but we need to decide which antibiotic we should start I think we're going to have to be sure. Yeah. Okay. All right. I think we're done. End case. All right. I'm going to remove my phone from here. Oh. All right. Okay. So I'm going to bring my computer around here. Um, so let's do a little bit of debrief. So here, I'll take this off so you can see me. All right, so generally, how do you think it, oh, you can't hear me. You can hear me, okay. How do you think it went, generally speaking? Well, uh, it was difficult to manage uh, 
from the computer. Maybe I, I am not used. Um, but um, I, I really love your simulation lab <laughs> theater. <Yeah. laughs> well, give us a few minutes. You'll learn much more about it. This is just one of many, many rooms that we have. <laughs> okay. Oh, wow. okay. So, what do you think happened with this patient? Uh, well, mm, probably he. Mm, got injured um, during this scuba diving. Um, at first uh, we thought about embolism, but um, he was having high temperature, so yeah. maybe it was like a septic shock going on and then he just crashed. So um, uh, we, we delayed in doing the uh, lab test uh, and uh, we delayed in uh, starting the uh, antibiotic. Um, um, so, in, so a, in a diabetic, a diabetic middle-aged man who had an injury in the water to his leg, and the leg looked pretty bad, um, to yeah. get sick enough to cause cardiac arrest uh, from that, what do you think we could call that type of infection? Do you have any ideas? Anyone in the audience, please tip in if you have an idea of what it was. Either just unmute yourself and say it or put it in the chat. What do you think this was? Two words. I'll give you a hint. Two words. Yeah. First letter is N. Yeah, if they brought it. You got it? You got it. You got it. Necrotizing fasciitis leading to septic yeah. shock and cardiac arrest. Yeah. So sometimes if you have, especially diabetic patients, are very high risk for this. Um, they have necrotizing fasciitis from a minor cut. Um, and then you saw the picture of the leg. It looked really bad. It was super painful. Um, he had a fever. He was tachycardic. He had all the signs of sepsis. And then he decompensated and went into a cardiac arrest. So, um, you know, getting on top of treating the, obviously, the cardiac arrest, the intubation, the blood pressure, um, I think for a patient in septic shock, what would be your dose of fluid bolus for fluid, uh, septic shock? How much? What's yeah, the well, bolus? Shock. Well, actually, the like, guidelines say 30 milliliters per, yeah, kilo per kilo per hour yeah. in six hours. Um, that's the guidelines, at least. Yeah, in a theory, 30 millimeters per kilo. 30 ml per kilogram. So, actually, two liters, you know, in, um, in a 100 kilogram man, let's say, that would be three liters, right? So 500 was a little bit low. So don't be afraid of, especially if they're hypotensive, you know, this guy does not have a history of congestive heart failure, so we don't have to worry about the fluid. So hit him hard with the fluid, and if, there's, if the fluid is not working or you don't have time or he's unstable, it's okay to start pressors. You chose the right one. The levofed was the right choice, but it's okay to start that early and it's okay to give that peripherally for a short period of time, okay? You don't need a central line to start pressors. If you're going to be on pressors for a long time, then you want a central line. But for 12 hours or so, or even sometimes more, you're okay to start pressors peripherally, okay? Let's talk about antibiotics. So if we're concerned that this guy's really sick and he's in septic shock, and we need to really hit him hard with antibiotics, um, so I know that it's a little bit different in different countries based on resistance patterns. But this is someone I would start with big, big gun, broad spectrum antibiotics, okay? What are the most common bacteria that cause necrotizing fasciitis? <clears throat> Staph, sometimes strep, 
things like that. So especially with MRSA being a big problem in many places, I think vancomycin would be an important thing to start to cover MRSA. And then in America, we would start something like Zosin to cover the rest. So vancomycin and zosin are our two usual drugs for this type of thing, okay? There's other things, if there's allergies or other contraindications, but that's a good place to start. Um, Doxycycline is a good thought because it is a rather broad spectrum and sometimes covers MRSA, but I don't think it's strong enough or broad spectrum enough for a guy this sick, okay? So you can always go down on the antibiotics later once you have cultures and things, but it's better to start broad, especially with a patient this sick and unstable. Which okay. is uh, the second one that uh, uh, you Zosin, you've Hyperacillin tazobactam, so Zosin. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, Piptazo. Piptazo. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I think it was a little bit complicated just because of being able to hear, but I think you did, you did a good job of communicating in general. Um, I think uh, it's easy when you're excited and it's a new thing to forget to do stuff you would normally do, like a full physical exam. Don't forget to do that, okay? Um, but you did a good job getting them on the monitor, getting IV access right away. Um, you know, so I think taking a little more detailed history and doing a little bit more of an exam is good to remember, especially when you're in exciting, you know, in a sim case and things like that. And, um, you know, just learning from the case and what it was about and having a high suspicion for especially a patient with diabetes with what looks like maybe just a cellulitis, but they look much sicker to think about necrotizing fasciitis because this is something that is time sensitive. So this is something that's a good example of where having good training in emergency medicine and having the training to quickly recognize this and get those antibiotics started and get the other treatment started is gonna make the difference for this guy between life and death, you know? He was already so close to cardiac arrest, the faster we can get treatment going, the better he's gonna do, okay? So I think that's one of the key points here. Do you have anything else to add? Here's Chris, our ultrasound fellow who was so nicely helping us Hi, out. Hi, oh, Sorry, oh, sorry, simulation fellow. Hi, thank you. Just helping us. So, Chris, if you wanna add anything, right. Or if you have any questions. No, I think that went really well. It's uh, definitely challenging to treat a patient over over uh, the internet, I think. Um, but I think you guys, um, uh, you know, did a good job in terms of like getting uh, like what the patient might need. And uh, I think it would be really intimidating to try to do a, a cardiac arrest and CPR over the internet. But you guys. Uh, managed it, so good job. All right, anything else that you guys want to talk about or ask before we move on to our next section? I think you are too kind, <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, I think we can learn from these, you know, simulation is uh, the perfect way to, to be educated, so uh, um, thank you for your opportunity. Okay to make mistakes. That's why we're here. That's what yeah. we're here for. To make the mistakes on this guy rather than a real guy, right? Yeah. All right. Yeah. So we're gonna take just a minute to do this. Yeah. You wanna you wanna do it in there? Uh, sure. Or you wanna do it from here? Whatever you want. You can do it there. Okay. We'll do it from here. Sure. Uh, uh, we're gonna move to our final room here, which is our our control center. For, sorry for my nostrils, <coughs> control center for the sim lab, and you will see where we sit to do stuff for you guys while we do our cases. Um, so I'm going to move into here, and then we're going to have an awesome presentation about our sim lab. And here we go. Okay. Is it recording? Is mine? Yep. Oh. All right. So. Sure. Yeah. Okay. We are going to pull up the next presentation.
Give us just one minute. Just a minute, we're pulling up the presentation. So take a two minute break. Okay. Okay. Up. Can you hear? Yep. Should be good. Okay, I can get started? Yes. Okay. Hi everyone. My name is Chris Ding. I am a emergency medicine physician uh, here at the North Shore Hospital System, um, along with Lexi here in Chicago, Illinois. And um, I'm also spending this year uh, being a medical simulation fellow uh, here at the Granger Center for Simulation and Innovation. Um, and basically what that means is that I've completed my residency and really wanted to get better at simulation education um, and am learning from the really awesome educators uh, here at the Granger Center. Um, so today, uh, Lexi asked me to kind of give you an introduction to simulation, all its different aspects, and uh, its role in medical education here in the U.S. So to get started, I wanted to give you guys an overview of how medical education is structured in the U.S., because um, I know it's quite different from where a lot of you guys are probably um, tuning in from. So. For us, after our primary education, we spend four years in uh, college where we select a major that may or may not be um, uh, related to medicine, anything from uh, social sciences to liberal arts or even sciences like biology or chemistry. And then after those four years, uh, we then go on to medical school, which is another four years. And medical school is um, largely classroom and lecture based for the first two years before we, moved, uh, before we move into clinical rotations in the second two years. Um, and then toward the, our, toward the end of our third year, we start thinking about what specialty we want to go into and we uh, uh, apply for residency, which depending on the specialty can last three to seven years. Uh, the higher end is something like neurosurgery, which just takes a while. And at, beyond residency, you can actually further subspecialize uh, with different fellowships. So to understand the role of simulation, I think you kind of have to think about traditional medical teaching 
And I think this is probably true of um, all of you out um, in different countries, but uh, there's, I think, a lot of medical trainees perceive a pretty big gap between going from books and lectures and then kind of being thrown into a uh, kind of crazy clinical environment. Uh, and that's especially true in my specialty in emergency medicine, where things can be quite chaotic and dedicated teaching can be quite hard to come across, uh, both on the teachers and it's hard to, you know, focus on both the patient as well as your educators. And then on the edu on the learner side, um, you know, it can be hard to sit down and really think through problems when you're, you know, going at such a fast pace. Um, and so simulation can help to bridge this gap. So zooming in a little bit closer on this picture, you can see the attending physician who is directing her attention to the patient. Uh, this is in a trauma bay where the patient is potentially quite critical. And so really all of her focus is on the patient in front of her and taking care of them. Um, oops. However, you can see that she's, she has all these learners around, around her. They're, they may or may not be paying attention to exactly what she's doing. They may be examining different parts of the patient. Uh, looking at other parts of the room, uh, getting other things done. And so sometimes it can be hard to really focus on education when people, when there's so much to do. Uh, so simulation helps us to redirect our attention. Uh, basically, the teacher can really focus on just the learners since there is no really sick patient who may potentially die. Um, and so in simulation, we have learners kind of go through uh, the steps uh, of taking care of a patient while the teachers are really focused on observing their learners, trying to see what they can improve, um, and kind of responding to their different actions. And then another great thing about simulation, like we just did, is the debrief afterward. Um, everyone can sit down and really kind of look back on the scenario, what could have been done better, um, and what was already done well. And the teacher can basically go around and give, uh, you know, individualized and tailored uh, uh, coaching and tips to each of his or her learners. Uh, there are a lot of other reasons why we do simulation. One of them is to practice uh, kind of rare but very critical situations. So I think for any physician, uh, regardless of their training, a sick neonate is definitely a very uh, rare, but certainly very scary event, just because they are not small adults and work quite differently from our adult patients. And those, so this is a common scenario that we run through to make sure that we are on top of these uh, clinical situations. Uh, here in this picture, you see a simulation of uh, a mass casualty incident, which unfortunately is not, is becoming more and more frequent. Um, in the United States, although it certainly is still a rare situation, and I don't think most people feel like they're immediately ready um, for these when they happen. And so uh, mass casualty um, incident simulations are also something that are frequently done, especially at trauma centers like ours. Along those same lines, we also simulate uh, rare procedures. Uh, so in this picture, a learner is performing a pericardiosynthesis in which uh, a needle is inserted into the pericardial space and um, it's basically drained of fluid to help relieve any sort of cardiac tamponade and uh, basically contraction limitation from fluid. Um, and another great advantage of simulation is basically be able to debrief with uh, in a group setting, learning from uh, people of your same level of training and giving feedback. Um, but also you can, you know, collaborate with people from other uh, specialties, uh, other professions, whether it's nursing, pharmacists, and in these simulations you can really get a sense of, you know, how they perceive the same clinical situation from their particular role. Um, another aspect of simulation that can be quite interesting is basically quality improvement. 
So because we are running through different clinical scenarios and really taking re-examining them after uh, we've run through them, you know, you can come to certain insights about how things work and how uh, certain protocols or processes may fail uh, patients. And basically through simulation, you can kind of come up with new processes and protocols to help to prevent those from happening. And so there's a, you know, a good connection between simulation and broader efforts in the hospital to improve patient care. Um, one aspect of simulation that I think is really interesting is uh, actually medical device development. Uh, in some simulation centers, including ours, uh, medical device companies will sometimes come to our center to test out different devices and see how uh, doctors and nurses use a device that they're considering bringing to market and uh, seeing what improvements might need to be made to them. Uh, one, one project that I had been involved in in residency was actually rollout of a new device in our emergency room of a fiber optic glide scope. And this is basically allowing emergency medicine physicians to perform nasal intubations um, with a video guided uh, fiber optic scope, which um, I thought was really cool and it's not something we typically do. Um, so that was uh, something that I really enjoyed doing. Okay, okay so next I wanted to uh, show you guys a tour of the Granger Center. Um, so let me just pull this up really quick. Um, any questions about anything I've gone through so far? I'm going to need your help with this, Lexi. Well, <laughs> Command C, right? For copy? Yep, that's right. Okay. Yeah, there should be. Oh, yeah, there's a one. Welcome to the Ranger Center for Simulation and Innovation, located at North Shore. Can you hear it? Can you hear it? Can you hear it? University Health Systems Evanston Hospital. Our 16,000 square foot healthcare simulation and training facility is one of the largest in the Midwest and features both medical and surgical high fidelity simulation spaces. With a proud institutional history of simulation dating back to 2002, our center opened in 2011 and has grown to meet the needs of approximately 5,000 learners per year. Our current lobby receives learners and is fully equipped to support pre- and post-evaluations, as well as flex into a debriefing space. There is a small kitchenette providing basic hospitality to foster a welcoming environment and an element of a safe learning space. Moving around the corner to the right are our main two classrooms that can accommodate up to 20 learners each. These fully integrated spaces feature minimal latency live feed audio-visual capabilities for observers or video assisted debriefing and evaluation. Traditional didactics or pre-experiential instruction can happen in these spaces, as well as tabletop planning sessions, research collaboration meetings, or small skills stations. The breakaway wall between the two rooms allows for a large space for bigger learner groups of up to 40. The medical lab features seven versatile drive lab rooms furnished to emulate real clinical spaces within the North Shore system. Two rooms on the left are often called Trauma 1 and Trauma 2, but are generically resuscitation bays to mimic the ER, ICU, or PACU, and have breakaway fourth walls and sliding glass between them.
Moving down the left side of the medical simulation lab are three basic patient rooms that can be outfitted with office furniture or hospital furniture and are ideal for communication or standardized patient encounters or for smaller team mannequin-based scenarios and interventions. Computers with access to a practice platform for the EMR are available throughout in the event that ordering or charting are a learning objective. As you can see in each of these spaces, we have the capacity to accommodate mannequins that require an external air compressor and hard wiring, as well as wireless network capabilities for tetherless high fidelity mannequins. In an effort to avoid negative learning, promote the fictional contract, and impact patient care, we use beds, crash carts, and equipment that is identical to that in our clinical environments. At GCSI, we practice how we fight. The right side of the hall features two ORs, which are ideal for large resuscitation teams, intra-op crisis training, anesthesia training, OR deliveries, and neonatal resuscitation. The control room allows for recording, monitoring of biofeedback, and indirect facilitator observation. There are four stations that our simulation techs have the ability to tap into any room through our Level 3 healthcare audiovisual technology. Within this core, a quick storage room holds the most commonly needed medical supplies for quick reset of scenarios and adaptation on the fly without delay. Making our way down the hall, we find ourselves entering the Surgical Skills Simulation Lab. The Surgical Skills Lab can be used as one lab with 15 stations or can be divided into three sections to allow three groups to work separately at the same time. Three super stations, one in each section, have the capability to route video feed from that station to any or all of the 14 remaining stations. A wireless microphone and 14 pre-installed speakers provide audio broadcast. Each 15 square foot wet lab station is equipped with a surgical table and mayo stand, a ceiling mounted surgical light, ceiling mounted 25 inch high definition monitors, and ceiling mounted gas supply lines for oxygen, CO2, nitrogen, and vacuum. With a special emphasis on minimally invasive techniques, this suite also features endoscopy towers, laparoscopy towers, and a Da Vinci robotic surgical system. Our fully functional scrub area is located between a second entrance to the locker rooms and the surgical lab. A third classroom situated just across from the surgical simulation space offers basic amenities and AV and is a staging or holding space during standardized exams or structured research simulation curricula. This space is ideal for groups of 10 or less. Each side of the simulation lab has dedicated storage spaces for models, mannequins, and medical supplies not in use to minimize hazards and distractions within the learning environment. The main storage room for the medical side also hosts the servers for our network and video recording. Throughout the labs and adjacent space, there are similar storage rooms for specific classes of medical equipment, such as ventilators and anesthesia machines, or procedural equipment not in use. External is a procedure room for static task trainer stations. We are in the planning process for redeveloping existing and new space to be able to accommodate more learners simultaneously. We also intend to make the space badge accessible 24-7 for mastery learning, just-in-time training, and to accommodate staff who work evenings and weekends. Our operations and research team have offices along two halls along the east and west perimeter of the Granger Center. There are two locker rooms with individually secured personal storage units with a shower, surgical scrubs, and restroom facilities. The office nearest the simulation spaces serves as a break room and facilitator workroom during transition. The operations teams share an innovation lab for making synthetic tissues, developing new models, and prepping moulage.
Thank you for this opportunity to share our space with you. When we aren't here, you can find us taking simulation on the road to any of our six hospitals or community-based spaces for insight to via our Simulance, which is a custom outfitted Type 3 ambulance that serves as safe transport for our mannequins and equipment, but also has an extendable awning and AV system for hosting on-the-spot training for things like layperson CPR or medical virtual reality. While our tenure here at North Shore is well established, we are looking to the future and are grateful for the opportunity to train our team to deliver healthcare for what's next. Yeah. Okay, great. So that was a tour of our simulation center. I will say that um, kind of in the spectrum of simulation centers in the U.S., I would say this is probably a fairly extensive one, uh, both in terms of space, equipment, um, and the personnel who are available uh, here at the center. Uh, you know, I've seen anything ranging from a single room with just a mannequin, um, and then kind of on really the higher end, there are about two or three entire simulation hospitals that have been built in Florida. I believe in my one in Miami, and then we're all one also in Orlando. Um, but certainly, we're very lucky to have all the resources that we do have here um, at the Granger Center. Uh, so this is a picture of our founder, the gentleman uh, kind of in the middle. Uh, this is uh, Ernest Wong, who is uh, really wrote a lot of the foundational literature for modern simulation. Um, and he's now the chair of the Department of Emergency Medicine, but still uh, he stays involved in simulation here at the Granger Center. Um, you know, his vision was really to reach, um, you know, even though he was emergency medicine trained, um, his vision is really to uh, reach learners of all levels in all specialties. Um, and I think at the center we really do that on a daily basis. We teach medical students, residents, fellows, attendings, um, all sorts of different disciplines, whether uh, it's individuals from nursing, uh, mid-levels, pharmacists, and uh, PCAs. And, um, you know, we uh, help out with uh, learning and teaching uh, from both medical and surgical specialties. Uh, given that we're split into medical and surgical sides at the center. We do simulations across all of our different hospitals, um, like Dr. Wild alluded to in the tour video. Uh, so we have four main uh, North Shore hospitals, which you may, uh, you know, have the opportunity to be at if you rotate with Dr. Azro. Um, and then, uh, like a lot of hospital systems in the U.S., North Shore is expanding and acquiring other hospital systems. Uh, so uh, there are also uh, simulation efforts at uh, Swedish, Edwards Elmhurst, and Northwest Community Hospital, which are all in the Chicago area. Uh, we reach out to all these hospitals and even to lay people out in the community uh, using our simulants, which you also saw in the video. Um, and this is also something that you know, we keep a lot of equipment in so that we can educate members of our community. Another initiative that we're starting here is utilizing 3D printing to uh, develop, develop our own models um, and working with uh, radiologists and specialists like cardiologists and surgeons uh, to develop models so that they can better visualize parts of their patient's bodies uh, before going in surgically um, and basically allowing them to practice their procedure before doing, uh, doing it on their patients. We also work a lot with silicone molding to uh, develop models. Uh, 3D printing is more like rigid, hard structures, whereas soft tissues allow us to uh, make flexible ones. And so in this picture, you see us pouring uh, different layers to develop uh, a uh, basically a simulation of a laceration uh, with the skin, the sub, uh, subcutaneous fat, and then the muscle layers. Um, and of course, we're always interested in developing new cases uh, uh, for us to run. 
in our scenarios. Um, you know, we do it for all sorts of different specialties. One area that I'm interested in personally is uh, rural simulation. A lot of emergency medicine physicians in the United States are actually trained in large urban centers. And when we go out into, um, you know, more sparsely populated areas, we may not have seen some of the problems that they encounter um, in more rural communities. Um, and then also another aspect is uh, international simulation. So uh, basically simulating uh, conditions and diseases that we may not see very often here in the U.S., but that you guys um, may see in your particular country. Um, and we may actually still need to uh, treat these patients if they're visiting or if they emigrate to our country. And so these rare uh, conditions is something we're interested in simula simulating as well. One of the cutting edge aspects of simulation is virtual reality, where we uh, basically utilize essentially video games to uh, simulate different medical scenarios, but also incorporate an aspect of uh, physical touch and tactile response. Uh, so basically in this picture you see the learner uh, using goggles and uh, he, see, he sees basically what you see on the screen here, um, even though it's not physically there. Um, so this is kind of, oops, so this is a video that I wanted to show you guys to give you a sense of what virtual reality looks like. Um, this is something that this particular video is from, I believe, the University of Maryland. We haven't quite implemented this uh, yet at our simulation center, but it's definitely something we want to be able to do, uh, hopefully in the near future. So let me pull up this video. So in this case, the learner is starting off in the waiting room of a hospital and receives a call. Hello? Yes, hello. Could you go over to exam 17? Paramedics brought in a patient with chest pain. The nurse is expecting you. Okay, I'm coming. He basically walks over to the patient's room. Hello. Hello. I am an intern, and I'll be taking care of you. Can you tell me why you came to the emergency room? I called the paramedics because I suddenly started having chest pain and trouble breathing, too. I panicked. When exactly did the pain begin? An hour ago. It hit me all of a sudden. Before that, I was feeling fine. What's the matter with me? We are going to run a few tests to find out the cause. Can you describe your pain in more detail? It came on suddenly, like I was stabbed. It's horrible. And what side is the pain on? On my right side. Do something, please. Okay, we are going to take a look into this. Let me first check your vital signs. And keep in mind in real life, the learner is basically going through all these physical motions to um, you know, assess the patient and examine. You'll see that he'll pick up some stethoscopes and place it on the patient. So in this case, the patient has decreased breath sounds on the right and uh, ends up having a pneumothorax. Um, yeah, so that's virtual reality. That's something that we're hoping to implement soon. Um, and that's kind of all I got. Uh, thank you for taking the time to listen. Uh, let me know if you have any questions in the chat. All right. Thank you.
good. That was awesome. Mm -hmm. um, I will leave you of your duty. <laughs> take it back over to the driver's seat okay. here. All right. So um, let's go back to our screen here. Uh, okay. So we have a few extra minutes at the end here. Um, a lot of people have had to go a little bit early. Um, but um, I just want to, again, thank all of the people who uh, helped out today to give presentations. It was great. Um, I'm really happy with our first session. I think it was a good start. Um, if you have any questions about anything we talked about or anything at all, please ask now. Um, or you can always send us a message, email me, send me a text, whatever. Uh, I'm always available. Um, for people, if you have friends or colleagues who couldn't be here but want to see the presentations today, we did record everything, and we're going to put it up on our YouTube channel, which will be linked through our website. So please share that um, if other people would like to watch the, the conference at a later time. Um, one last thing, and we will email this to everyone also who was here today. Um, we would like, if you could, to take two minutes and fill out a survey about uh, the conference today Please give us feedback. Um, one of the advantages of being a small organization is we can actually listen to you and make the changes that you want. So if there's any suggestions, you want more of something, less of something, a particular topic you want to learn about, um, we're going to be doing this every month. So we're taking requests. We will very closely look at your feedback and make adjustments to the conference um, based on that. And if um, you could fill out the survey, that would be a big help to us to be able to do that moving forward. Um, I just want to also highlight our simulation lab staff. As I mentioned, um, because this is such a big sim lab, which you see now, it actually has its own staff. Um, these are people that work here all the time, and they're amazing experts at this stuff, way better than me or anyone else. So um, I'll just kind of point the camera over here for a minute, and you can see who's here. Um, so this is Dan. He's uh, been super helpful all along back when it was Chico's, and again now, he works full time. If you want to say a couple words or just talk about your job a little, because I know this is something unique um, that most places wouldn't have uh, abroad. Right. So basically, I help coordinate all the sims that we have going on in the sim lab, be it from medical students to residents to nurses across all of our hospitals, which now equal seven or eight. I don't remember. Keep my hospital. Seven. Okay. I don't know. Seven. Seven. So we have seven <laughs> hospitals that have people coming in and out of the lab. So I have to make sure that everything is, you know, organized in terms of what rooms need what mannequins or props, and then making sure that they're on the calendar and they come on time and all that stuff. And also, uh, just knowing how to run this stuff. If you want to see, we're in the control room now. So during that, all those simulations, the lights are off, but we were watching through this glass door. And that computer is where we control all of the cases. He controls vital signs. We can put pictures up on the screen, um, all kinds of things that you can see. That's what we're doing watching you. So this is the control room where all the magic happens behind the scenes. And we are very thankful not only to have the lab, but to have the people to run the lab, because it doesn't really help to have state-of-the-art equipment if no one knows what to do with it. So we are super great in that regard. Um, again, the simulation lab is a big part of the exchange program. So if you come, you will be here a lot, um, and especially in the procedure room. You spend lots of time there with me one-on-one, -on -one, and we talk about details of all the procedures in there. So I think it's a great way to get a little bit of your feet wet in simulation and get more comfortable with procedures in a safe environment. All right, so if there's no more questions, we'll, we'll wrap it up. Um, I'll give you guys another minute or so to think about it, and... If not, just send me messages later. Um, and if you have any questions about the Sim Lab, the Exchange Program, or anything else, we are happy to talk to you. Um, it's nice to see so many people come out today. And I hope this will get bigger and bigger every month. So if you had a good time and you thought it was useful, please tell your friends. Um, please share the links, share the website, share the social media, um, share the YouTube channel, which will have all of the conferences recorded and put up afterwards. Dr. Asro, I was just going to ask real quick if we have sort of a preview for what next month is going to look like. Mm -hmm. So next month we are going to have a little bit different setup. Um, instead of talking me for 45 minutes, we're going to have three 20-minute lectures for the first hour on a topic that we'll announce that day. Um, and then we'll have simulation cases like we did today related to that topic. 
followed by another keynote lecture like we did today about the SimLab about the topic. Basically, this conference is designed to mimic the conference that we give to our own residents in the United States. Um, pretty much every residency program has what's called protected time, where residents are not allowed to be scheduled to work because they're required to be at conference. We do this every week for five hours on Thursday morning. Once a month is the simulation conference of the month. And so the residencies follow a schedule of topic of the month for their conferences that month and try to have it be related to the simulation cases that they do. So we're going to do the same thing in kind of miniature. So you're getting basically a taste of what residency is like for American residents in a small form, three hours instead of five hours, once a month instead of once a week but for you to get an idea of the types of lectures that we'll give. Um, once we have a finalized schedule for the whole year, we will publish that on the website, and so you can look at what topic of the month is going to be, if there's something you're particularly interested and want to be there in person, so you can ask questions, um, that would be great. And we will get in touch with uh, the other countries to tell them when they're going to be the country of the month. Anything else? Any other questions? Okay, thank you so much. Sure. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone, for being here. Thanks to all of you guys in the background here, everyone who did presentations today. I'm really, really thankful uh, and grateful that this worked out. And um, I hope we will continue to have more people every month, and I will hopefully see you guys in September. Please be in touch again with any questions. Please fill out the survey. Please share this with your colleagues and friends, and we will talk with you soon. Thanks, everybody. We're going to end the session now. Have a great rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank you.